Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, a very different um, Real Business of Wine uh, edition. It's the first time we've done it like this, so we're, we're learning as we go along. Mm -hmm. But this time we are essentially, I'm handing, Polly and I are handing the reins across to my friend, my friend Jane Anson, who is the uh, yeah. Bordeaux correspondent of Decanter. She has brought together a team of experts from Bordeaux, um, whom she will introduce. And we're going to be talking tonight about the 2019 vintage in Bordeaux, the fact that we, have, uh, we haven't had the en primeur campaign that we would have had at this stage, which would be happening literally right now. And some, um, some fascinating technical uh, innovations that we're going to hear about, about judging the vintage, not just with the wine in the glass, but also um, from using satellite imagery and uh, weather reports and so on. So with no further ado, I'd like to hand over to Jane. But please, if you have questions, we've got a lot of questions that have come through already, and those we'll be asking during um, the webcast. But if you have any, please feel free to chip in using the Q&A or the chat function, and we'll do our best to include you. But at this point, what I'd like to do is to hand over to Jane Anson. And Jane, the microphone is yours. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks so much, Robert. And also thank you, Polly, who you may not see, but behind the scenes is making all of this happen. So we have picked today to do this because this is the official start of the 2019 En Primeur campaign, or should be. There should be several thousand merchants and, and critics coming from around the world to be tasting this week. But as we all know, things have changed a little. And to make things even more surreal, it was snowing in Bordeaux this morning. And it's due to be 19 degrees and sun on Wednesday. So everything is crazy. But what um, we really wanted to do today, there's obviously always a lot of interest in Bordeaux right now. And I wanted to ask some of the people that I trust the most and I'm really interested to know what they think should be the outcome of, 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 of this, of, of the fact that we are not having on Primo as normal. So let me just first of all introduce you very briefly to the panelists and then we'll go to each of them. So we're starting in a moment to talk to Axel Marshall. Axel is a professor at the um, Institute of Wine and Vine Science. And at this time of year, every year, he produces a wonderful overview of the vintage, which he normally will be giving to a room of people where you have samples of the different styles of wine. And it's an incredibly useful uh, event during the Opry week. So Axel has very kindly agreed to give us a brief crazy Oh, well, actually, I should also say that half of the people here are French and they're very, very, or Italian. They've very kindly agreed to do this in English. So thank you for that. So Axel will give us an, an overview. We will then go on to Alain Renault, who is um, a, a consultant and also president of the Circle de Rive Droite de Bordeaux. And he, in fact, the Circle de, the Grand Circle de Bordeaux. And he will be talking to us about what, what he thinks might be the time scale from now on. When could En Primeur happen? When should it happen? Should this be something that we look at every year? He's gonna give us a, a bit more, a more context. We're then moving on to Nicolas Glumno. We're very lucky to have Nicolas, who is the director of Pichon Contest de la Lande, who will be talking to us about how the 2020 vintage is going, how people are adapting to the new reality of working, and also again about his 2019. Then we have Didier Marcellus. Didier has just been um, promoted to be a uh, Cru Bourgeois Superior in the last um, uh, ranking, which just came out about a month ago. This should be the best en primeur for him for years because he's just got this fantastic thing. So we're gonna talk to him a bit about the context. One of the criticisms of en primeur is that it's only for the 1855 estates. It really, that is not the case. And Didier can give us a really great insight into the use of, of, uh, cru bourgeois, of on, uh, on primeur for cru bourgeois. We'll then be heading over to Andrew McInnes, who does have a different way of selling. So he tends to keep his wines back for eight to 10 years and will sell them later. So interesting <laughs> to see a, a different viewpoint. And then we have two non-Bordelais to finish us off. We have um, Justin Gibbs, who I'm sure many of you know from LiveX, who will be talking a bit more about the, the wider um, context of, of En Primeur and how Bordeaux wines are holding up in this new world we're all suddenly thrown into. And fi finishing with somebody who I'm fascinated to hear from, uh, called uh, Daniele from a company, Saturnalia, 
And this is a company which I've only heard about in the last really month or so. They're partnering with Livex and he looks at using satellite imagery and weather data to see how estates may have done in a vintage. So perhaps we'll never need to come to On Primeur again because we'll be able to listen to, to what um, Daniela is doing. So that is a brief overview of what you'll be hearing over the next hour. Ask questions as we go along and, um, and yeah, so enjoy. So if I can hand first of all over to Axel. Thank you, Axel, for, for joining us. And I would love if you could give us really a, a five minute proxy of, of what you would be telling us um, if we were at the Institute of Enology this week. Okay, thank you, Jane. Thank you, everybody, for this, uh, uh, for this invitation and for this uh, nice invitation. Uh, so I will try to, um, uh, today, the, the report concerning the on primer, the, the vintage, uh, the 19 vintage has been published by my institute, University of Bordeaux and the Institute of Vine and Wine Sciences. And uh, with my colleagues in this uh, report, we try to summarize the main points of the, uh, of the vintage uh, on a climatic point of view. And uh, with the factual points, we try to, uh, to explain the composition of the grapes and the, style of, and the styles of the wines. Um, first, maybe we can remember that uh, great vintage in Bordeaux uh, is, um, uh, is led by five conditions. Don't you understand I'll murder you. Switch it off. <laughs> Sorry, excellent. Shut up, Carry on. <laughs> yeah, okay. So this, uh, <laughs> you, can, you can find these five conditions every year in our report. And um, the first one concerns the flowering. Uh, the flowering has to be uh, rapid, homogeneous, and uh, uh, quite early uh, to, uh, to give uh, a good homogeneity of the, uh, of the, met of the ripening and uh, also uh, a good quantity of, uh, of grapes. Uh, during um, this, uh, this crucial period, um, that is at the end of May or June, we, uh, the beginning of June, we hope that there is no uh, too much rain to avoid uh, uh, coulure or mirandage, that is uh, fl flowering problems. Then the second condition concerns the nuison, food set, and uh, we hope no rain during this uh, period. The third condition is particularly important. Uh, we hope that there is a, the end of uh, the shoot growth uh, just near or before the veraison, the color change. Then the fourth condition. Um, is a dryness and moderate heat during maturation, during ripening of the, of the grapes, to uh, favor the production of sugar, color, and, uh, and tannins, phenolic compounds. Finally, uh, we hope a clement weather during harvest, uh, without fear of uh, dilution due to botrytis, uh, uh, dilution due to rain or botrytis. So uh, if, you, if, you, if we look at uh, this vintage, we can see that um, the, the winter was dry and uh, mild, and uh, except in, in January. So the bud burst was uh, quite early uh, at the end of March. Uh, but uh, after that, in April, there was a lot of rain and uh, there was a kind of heterogeneity of the development of uh, uh, vegetation in the in vine. And uh, then uh, the months of uh, May and early were particularly cool and rainy. So um, there was a, a, a big affair uh, concerning flowering. And uh, in fact, uh, the first condition was not totally satisfied. Uh, we, we observed some mirandage in particular uh, concerning uh, Merlot and the uh, old, old uh, uh, vines of Merlot. And um, so this, this first condition was not totally okay. Uh, then the second condition, uh, there was concerning the food set. There was a, a strong change of the weather uh, just at the end of June. Uh, and uh, the weather was very good and uh, very sunny, uh, very warm also at the, uh, for, the, for the last week of June. And uh, the nuison, uh, can occur in, the good, in good conditions uh, without 
uh, rain uh, during this uh, this period. So the second condition was uh, fulfilled for this uh, for this vintage. Um, and then we, we can rem you can remember the particularly hot weather at the, during uh, during July in some period during July uh, and. Uh, Generally, uh, the summer was uh, hot with uh, uh, some rainfalls, uneven rainfalls, depending on the area. And uh, the, uh, due to uh, the, the presence of, uh, of water in the soils, and also due to uh, uh, the climatic conditions, there was uh, uh, the, the shoot uh, growth can uh, go on the, during July. And the, the third conditions, it depends on the soils. On the, uh, on the best soils, on the gravel soils in particular, uh, there was a, a, sh a shoot growth just uh, before, during the raison. And for other soils, uh, the third condition was not totally satisfied. Uh, then, uh, the, the August and, uh, and September uh, were very dry, hot, uh, and sunny. And so the conditions were absolutely perfect for the ripening of the fruit. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, after uh, fearing uh, too much well water, there was another fear at the end of uh, mid-September. Uh, it was a fear of uh, water stress. And there was no water stress due to uh, some rainfalls, uh, very important to, uh, to achieve a, a good ripening of the, of the grapes. So, uh, this, uh, this rainfall at the end of September was very important to, uh, uh, to finish the ripening of the grapes. And so the, the fifth conditions, uh, the good weather during the harvest was uh, fully satisfied in this vintage. So uh, as a summary, we can see that even, uh, even if the, all the conditions were not uh, uh, fully satisfied, uh, the composition of the grape was uh, uh, very good due to uh, the end of uh, uh, of the ripening period, in particular the months of August and September, uh, so important for the uh, for the evolution of the grapes. Thank you, Axel. So you would say of the five conditions that you normally look at, yeah. it would be half maybe for the first one, yes. complete for the second one, maybe half again for the third one, and then complete for four and five. Yeah. For, so how would so, for the third one, it's not really half because uh, on some, some soils, it is fully satisfied. On other soils, it is not totally satisfied. So the, I think in this vintage, there is a kind of viability uh, according to the situation. Because if you compare the rainfalls in Poyac or in Sautern, it is absolutely different in, uh, in during summer. So it's absolutely not the same situations according to the, to the place where you are. So okay. it's, uh, it's not really, uh, in, in the, the main is a uh, half, but uh, it depends on the pace. But we can definitely say that where you have three fully met conditions, yeah. this is taking us into a good, a, a good to very good vintage condition. Yes. If I can just tell people generally, it's very rare to have all five vintage conditions met. Yeah, yeah. You have it sure. in years like 2005, maybe 2010, sure. but it's very, very rare. So if you're getting, really four out of five, pretty much, three and a half to four out of five, then we're looking at a, a good vintage. Yes, exactly. In particular, the condition four and five are quite important to, uh, uh, to give a good vintage and they are fully satisfied. Fantastic. Well, okay, well, thank you so much. Please hang on because I'm sure there are going to be lots of questions for yeah. you. So You're thank welcome. you. So if we can go from there over to Alain. Alain, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you have seen how many this this vintage what, what how many vintages have you done have you seen in bordeaux since you began your career oh now i can't hear that but maybe okay. other people can ah voila okay okay <clears throat> uh, i started in 1964 so that means a lot of different vintages i totally agree with axel uh, with the presentation of uh, the vintage but there is a huge uh, problem. It is the man who is in charge of uh, the picking, the winemaking, and, and all the decision of winemaking. So that is to say that if we can say that 19 is a good vintage, the difference is also linked with the skill of everybody. 
Yeah. Uh, what I want to point is, um, we started with my association to present this vintage in London the 12th of March, that is to say, two, months, two, two, two weeks ago. And uh, the, we had a lot of uh, people that came to taste this vintage. Among them, uh, three of your friends, journalists, well, you know, Jane, Jane McQuitty, uh, John C. Robinson, uh, and, 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 um, and so on. And they, everybody agreed that this vintage was a very interesting vintage. Uh, not exceptional, but very interesting. And according to the fact that, shall we um, delay the tasting in Bordeaux, there is a, quite a long time that I have been asking people to make this tasting a bit later on. The reason why it was the 1st of uh, April was linked with the necessity for a journalist uh, to print, to make a report and then to print for the review. Uh, but I can see that now it is no longer the case. We can make with the computers immediately to send to the other part of the, the world the, the, the tasting you have been doing. So, in my opinion, if this uh, crisis is uh, showing us that to present our, our vintage in June could be a good decision, that could be a good thing. My personal recommendation is to delay, in any case, in June, our presentation. Maybe the end of June this year because of the crisis, but no longer April. It's too early. Thank you. And what are you hearing officially behind the scenes? Are you hearing that it is that the hope is that it will go ahead in June, or is it more likely to go back to September? Uh, of course, every, every day we have uh, wor worse and worse um, announcements and that let us think that the, the coming out of a crisis will be uh, a bit late. So if it is the case, it has to be beginning of September. But next year, we will have no virus, I guess, not this virus, and we will come back to the normal situation. And in my opinion, I think that to, to organize all this week of showing of show of the future in in uh, in June would be better. That's brilliant. Thank you. And that is certainly a, a question that has come up over and over again. So again, I, I'm I'm certain we're gonna we're gonna be discussing that with people who are listening in. So thank you. I'm going to just switch over, and then I will come back to you later, Alan. But I'm going to switch over to Nicola. Nicola, coming to us from Pichon Contes. Are you at the chateau right now, or are you at home? Uh, no, I'm home. Hello, Jane. Okay. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Nice to see you. Um, so this is the time of year. Well, how many people should you be receiving at the Chateau in a normal En Primeur week? Oh, well, you know, the En Primeur week uh, now lasts something like three weeks or one month. Uh, it's something like uh, 1,300 to 1,500 people in three to four weeks. Um, so I guess this year we, we have to do it more tiny and uh, just taking time to uh, to welcome a few people like journalists, negotiants and uh, big buyers. Uh, maybe in June, I, I, I just agree with uh, Alain Renault. Uh, June is probably the best moment uh, to receive uh, all of all of them and, uh, and, and maybe you... releasing the wine in July. And could you see that becoming a regular event that it moves back or would you ideally like it to continue to be in April? Oh, well, the, the later it is uh, before summer, the, the, the better it is for wine to show better. Uh, that's, that's for sure. And May, June is probably better. Yeah. Can you tell us about your 2019? How, how if, if you were showing it today, what would you be telling us? <clears throat> um, well, I, I'm, I'm very I must say, impressed by the, the vintage. It's, it's now a few vintages in a row that uh, we are um, able to make good wines. And uh, I thought 18 was a, a, a very over-the-top vintage already to me. Um, but I couldn't figure out that 19 could be better again or the same inner good quality. Uh, it makes me think of the comparison between 09 and 10. And for the same reason, uh, 18 is much more like 09 as it's a very opulent and very expressive wine uh, when 19 is much closer to 10 
um, considering the tension into wine, um, the precision into wine, and finally, it's a very sharp, sharp wine. And uh, well, it's much more my personal style uh, as a wine lover, um, 19 than 18, even if comparing 18 in, and 19 is a very good comparison for the next decades, probably. Thank you. Um, and could you also give us an insight into what is happening in the vineyards right now? You've had the, 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 some snow maybe up in the Medoc this morning. In fact, I saw from Andrew that there is some snow in the Medoc. Um, yeah. And how are you coping with trying to make a wine, trying to deal with the vintage as it unfolds with all of these problems of getting your staff to work and, and making everybody safe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, as for today and this morning, uh, uh, the temperature was uh, two degrees Celsius high. So we had snow, but it was uh, liquid water once on the uh, on the soil, so it was okay. Uh, not too uh, not too cold for the vine to freeze. Finally, and that's very important because uh, we have had an early bud break for every every grapes uh, since last week. Uh, so uh, we could have had some damages, but it we are all fine. Uh, so that's good. As for um, the way we try to adapt ourselves to those uh, very specific and terrific conditions, um, you know, we have had a lot of water, rainwater this uh, this winter, and uh, finally very smooth temperatures. So that means that vine has started to grow a few days ago and herbs on, uh, uh, from the soils as well. So uh, uh, we have a lot to do in the vineyard. Um, tractors and giants are in, in the fields. Uh, our workers have many things to do. Um, but uh, we have uh, the uh, help of uh, people who normally work in the, in the, at the office. Uh, yeah. Some of them, they don't have work anymore so uh, they are not exactly jobless but uh, we have asked them if they wanted to join the uh, the vine team and some of them they they have accepted the proposal so uh, they are in the vineyard it's you know those very difficult and specific conditions we have uh, created something very unique and people uh, have found the resources to, to work together and uh, um, there is a, they have a sense of doing efforts to try to save what is, um, what they can. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hold welcome. tight and we'll come back to you. Um, yeah. Didier, can we move to you, to you now? You are um, heading up, or you own a, a Cru Bourgeois estate, which as we said, has, has just been promoted. So really, I'm sure you were really looking forward to this on Primeur campaign as being one that would be very positive for your estate. One of the criticisms that we often get about on Primeur is that it is only for the type, the, the Pichon Contesses of the world, mm -hmm. and not that it doesn't always work at, at the lower levels of Bordeaux, at Cru Bourgeois. Um, but I think you have a very different viewpoint to that, and I'd love you to share it with everybody. Yeah. Uh, I believe it's it's very much a cliche. I I, I went through some headlines uh, from your uh, UK-based colleagues, uh, pretending that uh, en primeur was very much like a, a fancy golf uh, party for for only the super rich to become even richer. And again, I, I pretend it's very much a cliche. Uh, just like Alain. Uh, mentioned before, uh, we do wear in London, we were in London actually two weeks ago, and uh, we were representing actually with the members of the Grand Cercle, very much the mid-range product that is not the top of the range, uh, not the entry point either from the uh, pricing perspective. And uh, we did receive a, a very good welcome from the UK uh, located press. And, uh, and, and most of them, even if they will not purchase most of our products en primeur, at least from the promotional perspective, do believe that that en primeur week, whether it is based now or in, not, in the next two months, has definitely a value. And what would happen at, 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 at Cru Bourgeois level if there was not en primeur? One of the things that we've heard is why doesn't everyone forget about it this year? 
and mm. move to sell the wines when they're in bottle. Why would you say that is not ideal? Um, okay, uh, I think it's it's not by coincidence that uh, Les Echos, which are, which is in France, most of the most respected is if probably not the most respected economic newspaper was making a one pager. Uh, I don't know if everyone will be able to, to read the headline, but it says that actually cash management is the lifeblood of small and medium business in Aquitaine. And remember before everything else that uh, a small winery uh, is not on the, only a winery, but it's also a small and medium business. So it's to me, uh, it's very interesting to see that uh, there is a clear focus at the moment by the COVID-19 environment crisis uh, to pretend that cash management is indeed more than ever the lifeblood of the, the small wineries. So to answer to your question, I think that uh, if all of a sudden, uh, most of those small and medium um, uh, wineries, either they belong to the left bank, Le Bourgeois, or the right bank, uh, presented by the Grand Cercle, Rive Gauche, they will all be confronted to uh, the following dilemma. Either you, you, uh, you try to pledge or warrant your current stock, or definitely you go for that imprimeur campaign, because at the end of the day, it's the only business process which will give you promissory notes and with those uh, promissory notes, try to cash in with your uh, financial partners. So definitely holding up uh, the, the stock for one year would, uh, would mean that most of the estates from the financial perspective will find themselves in a very difficult uh, economic situation very rapidly. Thank you. I think that really is an important thing to, to say, that it's not as simple as saying, well, we'll sell them when they're in bottle because that's what, that's what other, other people do. It's, it's, there are, you have enough trouble, I would think, at the moment with other challenges. To add that in as well is maybe too much. Exactly. So thank you. But we, we have brought in, I, I asked um, Andrew to join us because he does have a slightly different perspective. Obviously, he's been doing this for a long time. But Andrew, could you talk to us a bit about the way that you sell? You are also uh, in the Medoc, Cru Bourgeois level, um, fantastic wines um, that could easily be sold on Primo, but you choose not to. So why is that? And can you tell us how you sell? Okay. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit just about my perspective on the market, which sort of leads into that. You know, some of us are fairly fortunate in that we continue to, can continue to operate, you know, our business at a time where our customers are, are really impacted. And, uh, and, you know, and what's interesting that anything we say tonight, you know, essentially can change tomorrow because the environment is, is just continually changing every day. You know, we look at South Africa, uh, wineries were being closed down over the weekend, not allowed to harvest. And uh, luckily today they're open. Off licenses were being shut in the UK uh, last week, but they're now open. Containers were being stuck in China uh, because nothing was moving in the ports, meaning that shipments couldn't happen from Bordeaux or be, were being delayed because of, of this catastrophe. Uh, and even in France today, we're seeing the impact of you know, lo local transporters, for example, shifting their energies to more uh, essential items. Uh, there seems to be a rush on toilet roll, for example, and, and so they're not picking up as much wine from wineries to, to move to consumers. So there's, there's just really so much going on. And, and, and again, some of us are fortunate with the, you know, the, the, the multi-channel strategy we have and, and the timing in terms of where we sell our wines that, uh, that we can still you know, essentially function, uh, albeit on a, on a smaller level. So I think, uh, you know, the market to now is interesting. There's still channels open, you know, supermarkets in France and most countries, off-premise businesses, and again, in most countries. Uh, many of the off-trade are doing curbside pickups and home deliveries. So, you know, their business is adapting to, to be able to deliver wines. And uh, so, you know, there's just a lot going on. Uh, and I think... It's more important now that, that we really communicate well 
Uh, you know, typically I'd be, I do a little bit of business on Primera. Let's say it's about 1% of, 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 of a certain vintage. In fact, you know, when I look at it, uh, I'm not very efficient until, uh, in how I sell a vintage, I sell it over a 12 year period. So we might be selling, you know, young vintages on Primera uh, to, to certain customers, younger vintages to certain countries like the US who would like a big vintage earlier than, than others to, you know, to Japan and even in Monoprix in France where I'm still selling 2009 vintage. So again, there's, there's, there's still opportunities. The market is, is still open, quite vibrant in certain areas. But this week, for example, I usually would be sitting at home or sitting in the vineyard waiting for Jansis to give me 17 and a half points for, <laughs> for, for the 90 pointers from, from yourself, from Neil, from Chris, from James and the other James, so I could finish my annual Premier newsletter waxing lyrical about another vintage of the century and, and uh, announcing a marginal cost of living price increase. And, you know, now I'm sitting thinking, well, is that really our priority today? You know, do our customers have other things or more important things to worry about? And I think they do. So the newsletter will go out, keeping people informed, but there simply won't be a, a price list. So as you've seen over the past week, instead, I'd rather send them a, a video of, of, you know, what's happening in the Medoc this morning with the snow and then, you know, how I'm, you know, having a, a wine tasting with my neighbor through a two meter plumbing pipe across the garden wall, uh, just to, again, to, to activate uh, all the channels where, that we generally speak to, that we would generally be selling to. Uh, but then just now we may only be speaking to. Thank you. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, we just have to, to hold tight, really communicate. And there's, you know, some lovely things coming out. You know, I looked at uh, Gavin Quinn, he sent a tweet with, with him feeding the, the Dom, the truck driver, with penny bolognese uh, because he was scared that he wouldn't be able to find anywhere to eat on the road home from Bordeaux back to, to London. Uh, Mouton Rothschild this morning announced that three lambs were born in the vineyard. Uh, so again, I think it's, it's uh, important that we keep communicating. Thank you. And in fact, that you, you have the, because of the way that you sell, you have a lot already channels open in that way to go direct to consumers. Can I just very quickly, before I go to, to um, the last two people, head back to Nicolas Glumino, because it, that's quite an interesting, it's a different way of working. Normally at the Pichon contest level, you're going through brokers and then negotiants. Are you finding now in, in these new, this situation that we, are, that we are living at the moment, are you finding that there is more of a, are you feeling the thirst from your end consumers to hear from you, to get information from you? And how are you reacting to that? Yeah, that, that's for sure. It's a bit, it's a bit different, but because the situation is, uh, we're all very anxious. We, we uh, just can't figure out that every, everything is very important. Every single detail, even the communication is very important, but not always the same kind of communication. Um, as Andrew said, uh, I mean, one more vintage of the century. Let's go easy talking and, and uh, that's also why the tasting is also important. The one that has to mean something is the wine, finally. So come to the house and have a, have a glass of our last vintage, just to, to let you understand, well, finally, the hero is in the glass. It's not me. You know what I mean? Uh, so uh, communication, obviously, this year is very important. And thanks. Thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity to talk about uh, 2019. Um, but that's also why I hope we, we, we're going to have um, a premier week or month in a few, in a few weeks. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much. So can yeah. I um, head over to Justin? Justin, you're um, joining us from London, I, think, I assume. Um, you um, head, head up LiveX. Could you put some of this into a bit of context? There are two things that I'd really be interested to hear about. One is 
how is Bordeaux fine wine holding up generally? I, I know we read quite a few headlines that fine wine so far is being less affected than other um, investment areas. So I'm quite interested to hear about that. But also, what do you think in terms of the market wanting or being ready for Bordeaux en Primeur to happen in, in June or July or whenever it does? And could you put that in context of, I know that Brunello and um, other Italian regions have brought out wine recently. How's that been received? And, and do you think that could work for Bordeaux? Uh, well, I'll give it a go, Jane. I'm not sure <laughs> if I'll, I'll, I'll be um, uh, <clears throat> as informed as you may like. But uh, <laughs> uh, the first point would be to say that the market more broadly um, and this includes um, Bordeaux to a great degree, but also Burgundy, Italy, etc. Um, and this is the secondary market as determined by wholesalers globally uh, buying and selling wine from each other. So it does tend to <clears throat> lead itself, lend itself toward the 1855 as far as Bordeaux is concerned, the Super Tuscans, etc. So um, that, that said, the, the, the market for the last year has been adrift. Um, um, our broadest measure of the market is down about 4% year on year. Bordeaux itself down about 3.6% and the first growth of Bordeaux down 5.7%. Um, the reasons for that I mean, are well known. I think that we, we, we had throughout last year the, bre the complications around Brexit and currency volatility. We had from the last summer Hong Kong, China both political unrest and a general slowdown in the region. And then in October last year, <clears throat> tariffs from the US. So those things combined to make it, the market quite heavy going and basically had it on a drift for most of the year. Um, and now of course we have coronavirus COVID-19, um, which has, uh, I mean, sort of all bets are off in, to an extent. Mm -hmm. The market has been, uh, as you say, um, relatively stable, but that is as much as anything, I think merchants around the world holding their prices, waiting to see what happens next. And it's only been really a month, let's say, of this, this sort of this, 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 this really drastic change in mood. Um, what we do know is that the, 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 the natural bids, we, 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 we run a marketplace on behalf of merchants globally where they can place bids and offers on wines they're interested in. The natural um, level of bids has dropped away quite dramatically as people, I think, look to preserve uh, their balance sheets, their, their, their cash, and wait to see what happens. Um, I would add to that then from a Bordeaux perspective um, um, more, more specifically, um, Bordeaux's share of the total of this market has been in decline since the heady days of 2010-11, the releases of the 09 and 10 vintage, when demand from China, as we all know, was really driving uh, um, the um, driving the market and, and global prices. Uh, since then, the Bordeaux market has been in decline. Back then, the second of the secondary market, Bordeaux took up about 90-95%. Today, it's down to 50%. So you mentioned Brunello 16, we've had um, Champagne 2008, we've had um, some great vintages out of the road, 15 and 16, California 13, et cetera. Basically the mar market's been broadening for some time um, and it has been looking to other regions to, 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 to fill, you know, the collectors have been looking to other regions to fill the cellar. And that probably has something to do with Empremeur because I suspect when people think about their buying of Bordeaux, the majority of it is done, is, is done during Empremeur. And Empremeur, over the last decade or so, has lost a bit of its luster for people. And that is to do with the greater transparency and the realization that they're buying wines that are these great, great wines, but are going to be in their cellar and rely on their cellar undrunk for 10, 15, 20 years. And, 10 years on, they're still worth the same as what they were when they bought them 10 years ago, but they're paying for insurance, they're paying for, for uh, warehousing, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> the mood music toward Bordeaux um, began to change at that, that peak of 09, 10. 
Um, and if you were to look at just UK merchants um, sales of Omprimeur over the last a uh, couple of very good vintages, as Nicola has mentioned. I mean, there's been an embarrassment of riches for Bordeaux that produced some really wonderful wines. But the 2018 sales in the UK were only a third of what they were for the 2009 vintage. So we're nowhere, we're a long way away from where we were back then. A lot of the success of 09, besides the, the, the brilliance of the vintage itself, but was because the market that you'd had 08 beforehand, I think people forget this, the low price of 08, relatively speaking, had, had given a real boost to people who bought 08. They saw the money that was made from it, and it really set the scene for 09 being incredibly <laughs> successful. Could you see in any, uh, in any reality that, that, that to, this vintage could do a similar thing? Because surely prices are going to have to come down to reflect the four things that you have talked about, starting from no, China but way before the COVID-19 crisis. Could this be an opportunity to reset? Well, I mean, I this is this is this is for the chateau to decide. I mean, and, um, you know, I, I, I there, there are lots of questions as to whether Omprimeur work, who it works for these days. From again, from the the you know from the, the the top top growers point of view, it used to be that they way back when they needed money. Well, they possibly don't and they can sell off less and less of their crop and cover their costs and then hold, hold stock. And then at the other end, you've got the collector who thinks, well, I don't need to buy it now because I can buy it, wait five, 10 years and then buy the wine and it'll be a similar value. And I could have been you know, using my money for something else in between. But then you have, within that, you have the distribution system and particularly the negotiator, et cetera, who need the cash and the cash flow. Uh, and not just so, that, but as we talked about, the smaller uh, chateau. Yes, well. indeed. So is it, I mean, it is in the gift of the, the top, top chateau um, in times like this. If they were to release, my, my guess is the market at the moment um, is, is, is turned away. I think, as Andrew just mentioned, that the collectors have a lot of other things to worry about than buying another uh, 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 Bordeaux vintage. It's a big sum of money that you know, that hits the market, let's say it's, you know, half a, half a billion euros or whatever it is. Um, it's a lot of money. So um, in order for people to take notice and, and, and assuming the usual processes apply, i.e. that we do get to, uh, the trade do get to visit Bordeaux in, in June, taste the wine. It's a great, great vintage as we know. Even then, the market might be rather concerned about other things. Um, there's been a massive capital destruction, as we know, throughout the world um, um, recently. So what's gonna you know, turn their heads? I'm afraid it's gonna be price. And it's not really in the gift of the, the smaller uh, chateau to, 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 to um, you know, cut their prices. It perhaps is for the, the grander chateau, but whether or not they feel it's their duty, I don't know. Okay, thank you. That was, was um, excellent. Very, very well put. Um, we have got a lot of questions to, to cover, which Robert will be bringing in, but we're going to finish off um, the panel part by speaking to Daniele Di Vecchi, who is going to talk to us a bit about his company, which is doing something unusual, different, and potentially really interesting. And I'm particularly interested to look at this compared to what, Matt, what Axel was saying previously about the vintage. And what your, if you can tell us a bit about um, about the the the, the um, satellite imagery, etc., that you were using to assess vintages. Yeah, thank you, thank you for inviting me. Uh, just just as a brief introduction, I'm the CTO at Ticino Aerospace, which is a company based in Pavia, uh, in Italy, and Saturnalia is one of our services, and our expertise is on in geospatial data processing. Uh, for Saturnalia, we take advantage of several sources of data and we correlate them with perceived wine quality. So we do not limit our analysis to Vigo alone, but we consider patterns in weather data and features such as the exposure to the sun, the elevation and aspect, and the joint behaviors that all these variables have. Our yeah, assist is, it, is it your own technology that is tracking everything? What are you using as your base map? Uh, we use satellite data, but uh, so the maps are based on satellite data, but then the scores 
are computed uh, for, by the algorithm as a combination of what you see on the maps, but also of what you also, Axel, explain what is the weather, weather pat what are the weather patterns across the, the season. So and it's a combination of, the, of all the things together. Can I also ask you, how do you yeah. know which plots belong to which chateaus? Because uh, as we all know, in Bordeaux often, yeah. so Pichon Contest, for example, they would not all be exactly around the chateau. How, how do you yeah. do that? Yeah, it? most of, well, most of them are publicly available. Uh, some chateau also publish the, the, the maps on the websites. So it depends a lot on the, on the type of, of, of the, on the chateau and so on and so forth. In fact, we don't have all the, all the producers in Bordeaux. So how many do you look at? Uh, right now we are talking about 25. Okay, okay, great. So can you tell us and talk to us a bit about what you have found about the 2019? Yeah, uh, about the 2019, well, um, also according to what Axel said before, it was quite warm and dry, mostly from mid-June to mid-September. And um, so the total amount of rain was closer to the 2015 year, but the distribution was really different with scarce mid uh, rain from mid-June to mid-September. And that's what was mentioned also before. And uh, it was actually half of the normal distribution. Um, moreover, the growing degree days were uh, lower than 2018 and 15, if compared with, the, with these vintages. But also from our point of view, from the satellite point of view, the Saturnalia Vigo index in, our dis in the distribution was comparable to 2015 and 16. Well, well uh, while 2018 was a bit towards an even lower vigor. So from what we understood is um, that once more, uh, we, um, when we compare with the previous vintages, for us, the, the, let's say the uh, appellations that performed better than the others were Pouillac, Saint-Julien and Pomerol, uh, mostly depending on, on what we see from, from above and from the weather patterns. But uh, using the same approach that I'm mentioning here for the for the appellations, we can also zoom in, let's say, to the to the single producers, and that's why we completed the scores on a few of them. And so uh, I, I I don't know as um, Axel mentioned before, it was um, it didn't fit. We also see from our data that it was at the heterogeneous. As you as you compare the distributions around the different appellations, you see that uh, some of them performed better than others. Some producers performed better than others because of the uh, of the behavior of the plants. Uh, but we we also estimated this is a very good vintage. When so this is where you, what you do is is different to to the um, Institute of Phenology. You then project that forward to yes. see what you think critics will give. Yes. Is that right? So yeah. what, what's your expectation? Who, who are going to be the winners this year? Well, for us, very, very high score, for example, is for Mouton. For our, our score is 98.8 for Mouton. For Lafitte is 97.6, while uh, Talbot uh, is 90.8, so it's very stable across all the vintages. Not as good as last vintage, but it's very good indeed compared to 2016, as far as I remember. And so, you're doing this without tasting. There's no tasting going on. It's purely no, looking at how no. the vines have done. Yes. Looking at the time series of how the vines and the weather data and comparing with previous vintages, of course, yeah, did, because... Did you do this last year? Can you compare yes. it? To, yeah. So how did yes. your data compare to how the chateaus did? Well, uh, we did a comparison. Uh, of course, we cannot uh, speak about accuracy in this case because, uh, as you know, uh, quality is, uh, is perceived is not an objective measure. But uh, we, we let's say, um, all get the major trend for for the vintages that for the producers that released last year that actually were uh, 19, as far as I remember. We added five more producers. And the, the scores that we that we published for them were um, quite ma matching with the what uh, what the critics uh, published one month after because we published our scores uh, starting the second week of March. Okay, interesting. That's great. And I guess was it was last year the first year that you did it because I guess it yes. will become more and more 
useful yes. and interesting data yes. to track as, as yeah, the, years go. The more the more years, uh, the more data that we get, the more precise will be uh, all the algorithms. And keep in mind that uh, within five years, more and more satellites will be launched. We've increased spatial resolution and also uh, the capability of intraday intraday uh, acquisition, meaning more than one data per day. And this is going to uh, open even more um, what we can see and what we and all the data that we can collect. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. There's so many things I'd like to ask you, but I'm conscious that it is ten to yeah. 10 to 8 or 10 to 7 in the UK. So can I head over to Robert and you could take us through some of the questions that we have? Um, okay, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Um, I've got a number of questions here, <clears throat> including one uh, of my own that's been uh, other people have asked, which is that, and this slightly picks up on what uh, Andrew was talking about earlier. Um, instead of saying, let's just shift the en primeur from April to June, which is not a big jump, why not follow the Burgundy model of actually tasting the wine when it's been through its time in barrel, when it's ready for bottling or being bottled at a point where it's ready for drinking? Yes, you've still got the cash flow. Uh, you've got a, a gap in cash flow from where you are now. But once you're into that model, would that not be a better way to go? Justin. So you'd like me to answer that's a good <laughs> Well, I just thought that you're in the, in the... I would, I mean, look, there, 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 there is no doubt that there's a, a, there are a lot of people who would like to taste the wines, the final blend in bottle. I think there was, I think um, Rupert Miller of the drinks business wrote an article about a, a three weeks ago suggesting that because the, 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 the window to taste this wine is, is, is closing, um, and if it's not done by June, then it will have to be the autumn. And, and then if it's the autumn, you're almost running into the 2020 release, and why not therefore move everything one year on? And, and um, um, you know, taking, putting aside the cash flow issues, which obviously are, are, are significant. Um, I think a, a lot of people in the in, in the market would 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 be happy to to go with that, but that is that is um, you know that 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 would they, they prefer to taste the final blend and 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 make their to make their judgments then and be able to to buy wine and for it to to soon be physically available. But I but um, that's a big step big step on and and um, as um, well as 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 as. Um, uh, Didier, I think, mentioned, and, and Nicola, no doubt, feels that there, there, are, there are good reasons to maintain the status quo, not least because the distribution system needs the, needs the finance or the capital. Is there anybody else who'd like to chip in on that? Um, Alain, have you a thought? <clears throat> yeah, I think that everybody has to be free to choice the way he makes his sales the way he presents his wine. But uh, I go, go back to what I think. I think June is much better than April, for sure. Then, in my association, we make a second tasting just before or just after the bottling time. So we make two tastings. And we are a couple of in Bordeaux to do the same. But after that, it is a question of unification of all the association to, to present at the same time. because. You can't come. To come, it is a lot of organization for you, for us, for everybody. So two organizations, one for the futures and one for the wine bottle, is very possible if we are all together with the same spirit. So I have a brutal pair of questions from two different people, but they're related. Um, one is from uh, Moritz Luque, and the other is from, uh, which is the first question, and then the other one's anonymous. But is oh, this the that. right time to bring back significantly more margin into the chain at en primeur is one question and then the other question from the anonymous attendee isn't the truth of this current crisis that a liquidity crunch will mean the campaign is doomed to crash if not very heavily discounted anyway so would you get the pro we've been hearing that the wine is going to be at least uh, very good uh, certainly uh, good 
um, are you running the risk of having to sell it for a lower price than it's worth if you're going to be putting it on the market in June? Certainly. Uh, I, I think the tendency uh, before is not that one. The tendency for the wine producers was to to stay at the same price or to drop five percent, but not to increase the price. That is sure there is no tendency to make margin with this vintage. Anybody else like to chip in on pricing? Uh, I, I thought you might be. Would you? Well, well, I, mean, I mean, there's one. There, there's one thing to to I suppose say about, and I think Jane mentioned 2008. There, there are there are a lot of from a global point of view. There are some grave similarities between today and that time. That was a financial crisis of. Of, 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 of deep concern. The banking system was near collapse. This, some argue, is a greater uh, crisis. And what happened back in 2008 was the first growth went early and they went very cheap. And that basically refloated uh, the, the, the distribution system. Now, um, if, 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 if something similar were to happen, there would be no doubt that, that lovers of Bordeaux would participate. The question is, do the Chateau want to give up as much margin as they may need to in order to lift the, the, you know, the, 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 the distribution chain? Because at the moment, there is a lot of wine backing up within that chain, much of it actually still in Bordeaux, much of it in, in, in negotiation warehouses, much of it debt financed. It can't go on forever. This is a, this is a moment of some existential risk for a lot of people in that chain. And so there is an argument, yes, for that, but it's not, it's the, it's the gift of the shadow. And, you know, um, one, one might argue, why should, you know, you know, why should they? It's their wine, they make great wine and, that, and they can afford to hold it. So it's a, it's a question for, you know, it's, 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 it's in their gift to make that, make that call. I've got a question from Hugo Rose, Master of Wine. Um, I believe that Bordeaux producers are free to offer their Prima at any time. For example, Lafitte's very early offer of the 2008 vintage in 2009. It's not policed by the UGC, for example. Is there any form of antitrust restriction on reaching a collective decision over timing, or are producers likely to be in discussions over the mechanics of the campaign this year? I've always imagined that there is more discussion in the background than we're ever told about. Um, I'd be interested. Nicola, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, uh, despite of the crisis, we always talk to each other, uh, producers, negotiations, brokers, and, and so on. And uh, finally, uh, I think that uh, imagining uh, showing the wines next June and releasing them next July is uh, something that seems to be interesting for all of us. So it's a kind of possibility. And, and can, I, can I just add to that? Mm. By next, that's a French English thing. Next, he means, uh, Nicola means this. Yes, <laughs> this I, yeah, this I understood that. <laughs> uh, I've got a question from Jonathan Reeve, which also echoes what something else was saying. Um, on Primo focuses on the top few percent of Bordeaux's producers, but the wine trade pilgrimage to Bordeaux each spring also helps smaller producers, plus hotels, restaurants, bars, transportation services, etc. What is the ripple effect of this on the region's wine and tourism economy more widely? And somebody else mm -hmm. has also asked the question of, might we actually see a gap between um, a tasting of the top chateaus and uh, the rest of the chateaus. So is that possible? We could see actually a, a separation there. Um, Didier, have you any thoughts on that? I need to unmute you. Here we go. We, we, we are very much part, at least that's very much my, my, my sense since I, I, I relocated in, uh, in, in, in the Middle Peninsula, that we are very much part of the same ecosystem, so to say which is more and, more and more fragile, I have to admit, <laughs> especially in view of what's going on at the moment. But at least it's a very well-balanced ecosystem. And I've been a, a long time Secretary General of the saint Estef Appellation. And I think it's one of the value of those small villages is that they embody uh, 
various uh, elements of of uh, of the chain and the offering. That is, we have uh, we have not only uh, super second in Saint Estève, but also uh, several Grand Cru, Cru Bourgeois Exceptionnel, Cru Bourgeois Supérieur, Cru Bourgeois, and and down to a cooperative through Cru Artisan. And I think it would be very, very difficult at the moment to try to dislocate the, this value chain in establishing a twofold approach that is on one side uh, trying to dramatize uh, the point that indeed we have on one side the first and the super sec and then the rest of the world. I think that uh, a lot of us will have to lose uh, that momentum which is created by what Sylvika has several times mentioned as the locomotives of this world. But what about the, the effect, and it's may, maybe other people would like to answer this, the effect of all the other people in Bordeaux, not the chateau owners, but all of the restaurants, the hotels, the, everybody else who relies upon what happens every spring? Anybody? Anybody thoughts on that? Andrew, a thought? Well, yeah, Nicola. Uh, I, I, I think that this uh, our premier our premier um, tasting is not only about sales and uh, enology, it's also a question of marketing and communication. And uh, uh, this whole region deserves that kind of event lasting a few weeks uh, in a row. Uh, and uh, back to uh, when this, um, when this very tasting should occur um, it's a one thing to taste the one or premier so you hold on a few times in the during the aging of one vintage to talk and to mention this vintage so uh, uh, we always have this possibility to show wines a few times during the aging and it's good for everyone not only the classified growth but uh, um, all the the growth from Bordeaux would take the benefit of, of those shows. I've got a question from Miles Davis, which is one that I would like to, to uh, also ask. It's the elephant in the room, because we talk about tranche in Bordeaux, but the tradition of selling everything. And I never understood how you were, were supposed to put it, almost all of your wine on the market, but still talking about tranche, because how big were the other slices? So how much of any wine is now being released on Primeur and how much is being held back and how much is being sold in, in other ways? And that will be very relevant this year. That's from Miles Davis. Anybody like to answer that? Andrew, yeah, actually, uh, you would see that because you're not in that business. So I'd be interested in what you see from the outside of it. Well, it would, it would seem that with the, the the major chateaus less and less on the on the on the first release uh, it would seem like that from the outside but i have no actual right. idea on, on figures but that that seems to be what's happening uh jade perhaps you can I have my hand up yeah <laughs> i think you're there's supposed to be a button i do my hand yeah. up but anyway i'm actually putting my hand up to say that the reality is it's very different per chateaus some chateaus will still release 90, 80% of their, um, of, of their production on Primeur. And that will include people like Lafitte Rothschild, you know, right up to the top, some choose to release a, a very significant portion of their wines. And others, as we know, Latour don't at all now, but there are many more and more that will only release 20, 30, 40% at this stage, and then will hold more back. But the reality is that is not a global approach. It is individual chateaus making their, their own decision about it. Um, Lafitte has always pl played the game of this idea that Didier was saying of having a locomotive which will get everybody excited and get the negotiants to, to, to have some margin for the work that they do. And there are other estates who more and more now choose to hold it back and to release a second, not, not a tranche during the Empremeur campaign, but a second amount in bottle five, six, seven years down the line. So my um, experience from, from looking from the outside as well is that yes, more and more chateaus are holding things back, but not everybody does. I have a question from Nick Martin, which again, I think is, is, a, is a crucial one, especially since we haven't had the, 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 the campaign of everyone coming to Bordeaux. Um, who will become 
the key influences and what structural market changes might this actually speed up, might this quicken? Um, are we going to see the same number of people turning up in June or are we going to see different ways of uh, spreading the word about Bordeaux 2019 and in then about 2020 and the future of Interchange? Your, your question is, uh... Is who are going to be who are going to be the preceptor who are going to be the opinion formers about this vintage is it going to be the same people as we've seen in the last few years or is this going to be uh new people no. new ways i'd be interested for justin to, to chip in on that in a second but i'd be interested to know what you think no. Alan. For, formerly you know very well that it was bob parker that was yeah. uh, give, giving the, the rating of a vintage uh, now you are a couple of uh, 10 at least uh, journalists that are influential you know that very well you don't want me to be too old to give some names, but you have Neil Martin, you have Antonio Galloni, you have James Suckling, you have James Worth, you have Robert Joseph, you have Jane Hanson. So <laughs> to, be, to be honest, you know that 10, 10 journalists are very influential. And the rest of the journalists that come, because we receive, we, normally this week, we had 100 journalists that were registered for the tasting in mm. Bordeaux. That means that there is a lot of interest to discover the futures. But only 10 of them are important enough. But for us, it is very important also to have this. It is, not, it is, it is marketing, but it is also uh, research in which way we can produce the, the wine a bit differently. No longer blockbuster wine, a bit more elegant, a bit more refined. So there is for sure an evolution, and this evolution is also linked to the success that our wines have in future. Uh, Nicola, do you have any feeling about uh, the, the influences in uh, this year? Anything different? Oh, um, no, nothing different. I just agreed with what uh, Alain Reynaud uh, said. And uh, what is important to mention is that, uh, uh, as for me, and I know we are many people, many winemakers, and the same. Uh, I've never tried to make a wine just to please someone in specifically. So uh, the fact that now there are not only one uh, critic, but a few um, make things very interesting because you can't please everyone. Uh, so that means that you first have to make a wine as you really want to make it uh, with your own palate and your own skills and uh, feelings. I'm sure a lot of people applaud that. Justin, though, looking at the hard numbers, the, 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 what people are going to buy these wines for, uh, or which wines they're going to buy, do you have a feeling on this? Well, I mean, I think we've heard from everyone this evening, where uh, it, it seems fairly unanimous um, across the board of panelists that 2019 is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a good to very good, probably in some places, excellent year. So... Um, what do you do with that? <laughs> you know, um, Bordeaux produced a great vintage last year, a great vintage in 16, um, 15. Um, I, I'm, a, you know, I, as, as, as again, as Andrew pointed out, you know, the, the, the buyers of anything, not just wine, have a lot of other concerns right now. Um, in order to make a buying decision, they need to have their heads turned. Hearing that Ford has produced another great vintage, whether it be from the Chateau or from Neil Martin or from Lisa Pratty Brown or from Jane Anson or from whoever, is 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 not going to be a head turner. I'm afraid it's going to. So the influences are going to be the top Chateau and the price. And Justin, I have got. I think I'm nearly at the end of these questions, but I've got one. Um, worrying sort of question from Fredelos Nikos. Um, question to Mr. Gibbs, is the bidding, what he calls um, the bidding collapse, going to affect all recent vintages already released? Um, do you think that wine that's sitting in people's cellars or negotiating cellars is, is actually now uh, at jeopardy? Price -wise? Um, I, I, I mean, that's, that's, that's the, 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 it's a difficult question to answer. Um, at the moment, the wine market is, hold, is holding up, but transactions are definitely occurring um, below um, market price. We're still working on the numbers as to how far below. But um, 
you know, if people are, if people are forced sellers, there's going to be a movement in price. Now, whether you know, if 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 negotiants are forced to sell because there's a delayed entrepreneur campaign, or because if private individuals are forced to sell because um, of the you know financial turmoil um, that may have affected them over the last month, if you've got a period of crisis as in 2008, where buyers can afford to wait and sellers are forced to make a move, you will get a, 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 a price shift. Um, at the moment, it ha it, from now it hasn't happened, um, um, but um, we're, it's early days, it's early days. Thank you, Jane. I think I've been through, we have one or two questions, we've got various people making some, some of comments, but I think we've covered most of it. Jane, would you like to uh, wrap up? Because we're just about 10 minutes over. Okay, perfect. Well, I would just like to really say thank you to everybody for, for sharing your experiences. This has been an extremely unusual on Prima, start to the on Prima week and, and what everybody has said. There are many bigger worries right now than, than, than how on Prima is going to work. But what I am always conscious of is that there are people behind this. It isn't just about the price of the bottles. It's about the people who live from making these wines and who it, 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 it matters how, how this works. Bordeaux is a fascinating region because it is very much on the front line of the economic situation globally, worldwide. It always has been for centuries. So there is a, a real true human story behind the economics in Bordeaux. There always has been, always will be. So I'm really just thrilled that everybody has come to, to talk about it, to, to share thoughts. And I have no doubt that we will be discussing this for many, many years and decades to come. Can I say thank you on behalf of all of us here at uh, Real Business of Wine. And I think it's been one of the best things we've done. If anybody wants to continue a little bit of conversation, if you look at the chat uh, line, you'll come in the chat box, you'll see a Zoom code there, which takes you to Joe's bar where we can carry on the conversation for half an hour or, or so. Um, we tomorrow night have got a session on wine writers. And we have Tim Atkin, Master of Wine from the UK. We have Eric Asimov from the New York Times. And we have Elaine Trican brown who writes for Jancis Robinson and elsewhere. So that should be a fascinating session. On Wednesday, we're talking about wine education. We, mm -hmm. we have um, uh, Ian Harris from the Wine and Spirit Education Trust. The night after that, we have actually Alice Firing, the queen of natural wine talking about natural wine. And then on Friday, we'll be looking at the data of wine. So we've got quite a lot going on this week. Um, please come back. If you haven't seen this or you want to keep, you want to see exactly what we were talking about tonight in greater detail, or indeed what Jancis Robinson was saying last week, and indeed what we had, uh, what we had yesterday about, um, about biodynamic wines, uh, please go over to the YouTube channel and check out there the Real Business of Wine YouTube channel. You can subscribe there and keep telling us what you'd like to hear about. Thank you all. Merci beaucoup à tout le monde. À bientôt Thank et you. bonne chance et bonne Thank continuation you. à tout le monde. Merci. Merci. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.